from success, and success should be measured by the breadth of the good you do in your business. Bernie and Arthur and I can't, we have over a billion transactions a year in our stores. We can't touch every one of those billion transactions. We better figure a way out that every one of those people who do touch them feel like they're part and parcel, that they matter, that they're important, that we're listening to them, that what they have to say, we'll consider. I remember, uh, and I'm gonna cut this in a second because I wanna get your questions and everything else, John. We were opening a store in Elmont, New York, <coughs> and grand opening is Thursday. The grand openings are typically on Thursdays because in the old days, the, the, the stores, when they opened, they had circulars in the newspapers on the weekend. So you open the store Thursday night, Thursday and Friday, and then you had the big splash with the advertising, and you got the surge. Wednesday was called a soft opening. You just open the door, and the people want to stumble in and wander around. I was in the store on Tuesday night, and I'm walking around the store, and a young man in the plumbing department comes up to me and says, can I ask you a personal question? I said, sure. Honest to God. He said, were you guys born stupid, or did you become stupid after you were born? <laughs> and this is honesty, okay? You know, you know you're going to hear it, not as you want to hear it, but as he sees it. I said, probably a combination of both. <laughs> now tell me why I'm stupid. He said, come on with me. So he takes me over to the plumbing department. And there's a big box at the, on the floor underneath the racking. You go to Home Depot. And I'm, by the way, John assured me every single one of you people only shop at Home Depot. So that's, <laughs> I'm not getting a fee tonight. I'm not getting any kind of honorarium. <laughs> All I know is you're going to spend as much as you can in the Home Depot, and you can never spend too much money in a Home Depot store. <laughs> so I said, what's up? He said, well, look at where the plungers are. Now, think about a plunger. You typically only want to buy a plunger when your wife wakes you at 3 o'clock in the morning and tells you the drip in the faucet is driving you nuts or the toilet stopped up or whatever it is. You don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, honey, it's Saturday morning. Let's go to Home Depot and buy a plunger. Just don't do it. So I said, okay, to the kid, all right. So it's a bad place. He said, yeah, plus it's dirty down there. I said, okay, well, tell me what you would do. Oh, he said, I'd put pipe hooks on the edge of the racking at the end of the aisle. And he says, you know how you go in a gun store and you see how guns are on a wall? I put the plungers in that way. I said, okay. Why don't you do it? What do you mean? I said, Why don't you do it? You said... You think it's a good idea? Well, you're only going to know if it's a good idea. If you try it and it doesn't work, then it's not a good idea. He said, I can. I said, try it. So he did. Now, I went back to the store on Saturday morning. And he sees me and he grabs me. Come on, come on, come on. He takes me over to the rack. There isn't one plunger in the rack. I thought, you put them back? No, he says, they're gone. Hey, honey, we don't have a plunger. We got to get a plunger. Take a plunger. That's about a $4 item, and I'll give you, I'll let you in on a family secret. It's got one of the highest margins in the store. <laughs> okay? And everybody's happy because now when the damn toilet stops up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I got the plunger. <clears throat> the more people that you can bring to the party that feel a sense of ownership, every single associate at home, and they're not employees, they're associates. Every single associate that comes to Home Depot Every single one of them, the day they come to work for us, they're a stockholder. And I saw that work like a charm. I walked in one night to the, to the Jericho store out in Long Island. And a man comes up to the kid and he says to the kid, excuse me, young man, is a, are you in the plumbing department? He said, no, sir. He said, I'm a stockholder. I own the whole store. What can I do to help you? <laughs> okay? It works. I'll tell you something else about ownership. When you own something, you take care of it. Okay? Th th these are all such simple things. And all I can assure you with all the textbooks you're going to read and all of the, the spreadsheets you're going to create and all the stuff you're going to do, 
figure a way out to turn those people on and let them feel ownership, let, let them feel they matter, let them feel that they're precious, let them feel that your success is going to be their success and their success is going to be your success. You do that and you've got a killer organization and nothing will stop you. Nothing will stop you. Okay, John, I think, you know, I've, I hope I've warmed them up a little All bit. All right, you haven't. And by the way, any question, <laughs> any question is a fair question. All right, let, let's no just uh, invite, can you guys move down or uh, scrunch up a little bit at the back? Well, or, I should have gotten my feet um, by the head, my God. This likewise, part, at the other end. I could have made a fortune. May, maybe a few, a few of you uh, outside, perhaps you could come up to the front and hmm. uh, line the... Uh, I don't bite, come on in, come, come over on here. In. Come on in, everyone. Sorry, we don't have enough seats, but uh, please... Uh, um, line up a little bit on the side. There you go. Thank I want you. you on my football team. All right. You, I'm you. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ken a couple of questions uh, and then open it up, okay? Yep. I want you to tell the story about how you got started. The cardboard uh, liquor boxes uh, from way back when that you, uh, as a kid, took as scrap and how, how Lenny uh, later helped you out. Lenny Orman. My father was a plumber, he went to the eighth grade. My mother was cafeteria worker, she went to the seventh grade. I was not to the matter born. But I was always hungry for a buck. I always wanted to have a buck in my pocket. And I was working in a little Polish butcher shop in Roslyn on the North Shore of Long Island. And there was a liquor store two doors down. And Lenny Altman owned a liquor store. They were the only Jewish family in Roslyn, by the way. This is a potato town. This is potato farms all around. None of these homes that are out there now were built. Mm -hmm. So Lenny one day came to me and said, I got a problem. He said, I, they won't let me put the boxes, the liquor comes in cardboard boxes. They won't let me put the boxes out where the garbage man picks them up. And this is before they had these big mechanical trucks that what they really had was an open truck and you threw the garbage in, and then they'd take it to the dump, and they'd come back and go on the route. He said to me, they got to go out the night before, and he said, if you could, I'll give you 50 cents Tuesday, and I'll give you 50 cents Thursday. You bring the cardboard boxes out to this railroad tower, where it was an electrical tower, and you put them underneath there, and the next day the garbage company, will, the garbage collector will pick them up. So within a week or two, I'm there out there, and guess what? I run into the guy from the garbage truck, and I notice they're breaking the car boxes up. And I said, what are you doing? He says, well, he said, these are worth money. What do you mean they're worth money? Said, oh, yeah. He said, cardboard scraps worth money. I said, well, how much? He said, well, he says, these boxes here are buck, two bucks, three bucks. <clears throat> so I went back to Lenny, and I said, Lenny, I'll make a deal with you. Don't pay me anymore. You gotta let me do one thing. You gotta let me keep the boxes. He had an overhang porch in the back of the store. You gotta let me keep the boxes here. I'm gonna break them up, and I'm gonna tie them with twine, and then I'm gonna take the bundles, and I'm gonna call the guy that buys the paper, and he's gonna come and pick it up. I was 14, 15, okay. What do you mean? I said, well, I'll make enough sell on the cardboard. I'll be okay. And I made more than the buck a week I got, 50 cents two nights. And the wonderful part of the story, and, and I, I'm glad you're asking this question, John, because I want to assure you of one thing, and I'm not modest. Not modest at all. My life, my success, is a collection of thousands of people's efforts on my behalf of which Lenny Altman was one. Now I'm getting ready to go to college and I'm walking past the store one day and he says, hey, hey Lenny, how are you? He said, hey, you're going to college? I said, yeah, I'm going to Bucknell. And he said to me, congratulations, come on and I got something for you. So I went in and he had a little desk, he had a counter and he had a wall with bottles and then in the back of the wall was his little office. And he reaches in his drawer and he takes out an envelope. And he said, here, I hope this will help you in college. He put a buck in that envelope every single week, 
that I just said to him, I was making enough off selling the thing. He put a buck in, and I'll never, uh, uh, never forget it at the point I put it in the book. Why did I put it in the book? Because it's one more example of the goodness that's come my way through the kindness and caring of, of I said it, and I'm not being melodramatic, if you gave me Yankee Stadium, <clears throat> if you gave me Yankee Stadium, it wouldn't be big enough to hold all the people that gave me a break along the way. Mm -hmm. Hell, just 400,000 Home Depot people. Shit, that's four Yankee Stadiums. That's five Yankee Stadiums. <laughs> okay? So well, I'm not self-made. man. And I, I'm, I, although I will tell you this, my wife's prayer every night is, Dear Lord, if you'll make him successful, I'll keep him humble. And I tell her, God did his part. What the hell happened to you? Okay. <laughs> but seriously, if there's a message in my life, it's the fact that I'm a really a product and a beneficiary of a big hearts of an awful lot of people. So another great story in the book, Fast Forward, mm -hmm. uh, that I really enjoyed was the story about the IPO of EDS and your interactions with uh, Ross Perot. Uh, to uh, make that happen and the, uh, the P-E uh, ratio that uh, you ended up with. Well, uh, the, the, there's two stories. I'll, I'll make them as quick as I can. I got into the, my firm had never done an IPO, an initial public offer. And I was at a party in Washington one night and I heard that this man I was with at the party said to me that his company was going public. And I said, what's the name of the company? He said, it's Electronic Data Systems. And I said, oh, who are they? He said, well, they're down in Dallas. I work in the Washington office, and uh, we're going. We're, we're interviewing underwriters now to go public. And I said, "Gee, is there any chance I can get a meeting?" He's yeah. Well, the guy that's making the decision, Ross Perot, he's down in Dallas. And I said, "Well, is there any chance I can make a pitch?" <clears throat> so he said to me, "Sure." Now we were raising hell that night. It was a great party. It was it was the Louisiana delegation to Congress. I don't know if they still do it. <laughs> had a party the Saturday night called Mardi Gras, the Saturday night before the advent of Lent. So, for example, this Saturday night would have been the night they'd have this party in Washington because next week is Ash Wednesday. So he said, call me on Monday and I'll let you know. So I called him on Monday morning and he said, you got an appointment at 11.30. Let me tell you something. Mr. Perot is very punctual. Your appointment's at 11.30. You got 30 minutes. You got to be out at noon. Okay. What else? Don't swear. Now, he, he, that night we were raising a little bit of hell together, and I'm sure we used a few choice words. And I guess he figured, you know, better uh, good advice. So <clears throat> I took two young men with me from, the, from our corporate finance department. And we went down to see Pro. It was scary, exactly at 11.30. Remember the old school clocks with the second hand? As soon as that damn second hand hit 12 at 11.30, the door opens and we're taken in. And here's this little guy, big desk, like, remember Kilroy was here? <laughs> and so we go sit down. Come on, oh, hi, fellas. Ross Perot, nice to meet you. Come on over here. We'll talk a little bit. And we went over to the sofa and sitting area he had in his office. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, I'm glad you came down to see me. He said, I want you to know what I'm here. And he goes, takes Goldman Sachs, Whitewell, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Lee Higginson, G.H. Walker. These are all the firms that were then around. They're all gone. And he's telling me this firm told me this, and that firm told me that, and that firm told me that. And so finally, it's like one minute to 12. <laughs> All I could say was when I walked in, hi, Mr. Perot, and that was it. And so he, well, what, what do you think? Uh, we're all adults in the room. <clears throat> I figured, well, I blew, I'm going to blow the 30-minute rule. What the hell, go, go for broke. What do you think, I said, Mr. Perot? That's the biggest pile of horse shit I've ever heard in my life. He goes back like this. We talked for 13 hours. He was driving me around Dallas, because don't forget, we were going down there, we were gonna have our meeting, we were getting on a three o'clock plane coming back. We had no clothes, we had no shaving, we had nothing. He's driving us around Dallas at one o'clock in the morning, 13 hours later, looking for a drugstore where I could buy a t-shirt and some shaving stuff. When I get back to New York, he called up the next day and he said to me, you know, he said, I want to spend more time with you and I want to understand this thing a little bit better. I said, sure. And this comes down to the valuation. <laughs> so 
I went back down. And by the way, Ken, he said, would you bring down some of those prospectives that you guys put out when you do deals? And I said, sure. There's only one problem. We didn't have any. We hadn't done any deals. <laughs> I mean, you talk about running water uphill. So I, I go down. He, by the way, every time I went to see him, he picked me up at the airport and he took me to the airport. I can't say enough good things about this man. One of the most wonderful, wonderful relationships and experiences of my life is having him as a friend. So I go back down. We're meeting more. We're talking more. How does it work? And he finally says to me, what do you think my company's worth? I said, it's a one-of-a-kind company. Well, what does that mean? I says, it's like the Mona Lisa. If you want to buy one, you know, the guy, whatever the guy wants, if you don't want to pay, you're not going to get the picture. What do you think? I, I had no, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I thought, oh, probably, uh, probably 100 times earnings. What? I said, yeah, 100 times earnings. I didn't have any idea how much revenue they had. I didn't have any idea what their earnings were. All I knew was I met him and I said to myself, this guy's a winner. So he then drive me back to the airport. By the way, Ken, you got those prospectives? I said, no, sir. Forget them? I said, no, sir. Where are they? I said, they don't exist. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you're it. What do you mean? You'll be the first deal I've ever done. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, oh, okay. So I went back down one more time. Long story short, he picked us. He picked us. Why did he pick us? I want you to remember this, you kids. You're the reason I'm here. We had passion. We had enthusiasm. We had a great belief in what we were doing. And we showed it. Don't ever be afraid to show your emotions, okay? And he knew from day one that I wanted this deal so bad I could taste it. So anyway, the part of the story you want me to tell, John, is now back then, this is 50 years ago, your deals actually were consummated in New Jersey because New York State had a transfer tax. Jersey didn't, so we used to drive through the tunnel right after midnight on the day you're going to do the deal and sign all the papers, the guy, the limousine driver would pull off the side of the road and you and use limousine driver as a witness. You'd sign the papers, turn around and go right back into the city. Well, the night before, this is the night before, my wife had to go home. We had young children. They were going to school. She had to get the kids ready for school the next morning. And Ross and his wife, Margo, and I were driving through the tunnel to go sign the papers. He walked in. Now, by the way, the back seat of the car, it had seats looking backwards and the seat looked at each other. He and Margo were in the seats looking ahead, and I was in the seat looking at them. Well, Ken, I guess this is when you're going to tell me I'm not getting 100 times earnings. I said, you're right. You see, Margo, they're all alike up here. I'm telling you, they come up, they get us up here, and they skin us. They think we're fools. Look at this guy right now. Here's what he's done. They all, all your buddies in Wall Street warned me, you're going to give me this number, and you're going to back away from it at the last minute, and I got no choice because I got to get the deal done. I said, hold it, hold it. Don't, I don't want you upset. By the way, I would winked, and Margo caught the wink. <laughs> I said, oh, stop. I don't want you upset. If you want 100 times earnings, you get, damn right I want 100 times earnings. Where I come from in Texas, you put your hand out, a man puts his hand out, you have a handshake, you got a deal. You keep your part and I keep my part. I said, Ross, I'm sorry, you got 100 times earnings. And we're driving through the tunnel and the lights every once in a while, so every once in a while you can see the face, the light coming in. And Margo says, what were you going to do with that, Ken? I said, well, I was going to do it at 115 times earnings, but he only wants 100 times earnings, so we'll do it. <laughs> and we did it, at, we did it at 115 times earnings. Okay. Your word matters. Your word matters. Nothing's more precious to me in life, in your personal life, in your business, than your word. Okay? I want to tell, ask you one more uh, yep. story about Bob Grossman uh -huh. and... Um, the story of Bob and uh, NYU Medical Center. We have a big health sector management department mm -hmm. here at uh, Miami Business School. Mm -hmm. I see several of our staff and faculty and students uh, from. You the, also have a great hospital. Yeah, you got great hospital. You got Baskins. 
Uh, well, we cut uh, Palmer. Ba I think you're talking about Baskin Palmer. The that's the eye. Yeah, that's that's one of the world class. Well, but isn't that that's part of it's part of our uh, right. new health? System. Yep, yep, yep. So, so you, Bob Grossman, uh, <laughs> what did you see in him, and how did you and Elaine come to contribute so much to uh, medicine? In well, I, I gave the first money before Bob was there. I gave the first money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you really do well by doing good. Marty Lipton, a great corporate lawyer. If anybody knows anything about corporate finance, you'll know about Marty Lipton. He's a dear friend of mine and always gets me out of a tight spot. And he called me one day and said he wanted to come see me. And he comes to my office and I said, well, what's up? He said, well, we got a real problem and we need you to think about taking it over. It's a real mess. We got a problem with the people and we're suing each other. It was a mess. I said, you're not talking about the business school. He said, no, 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 I'm talking about the medical school. I said, does NYU have a medical school? Said, oh, yeah, we have, where is it? I didn't even know where the hell it was. He <laughs> said, it's over here in First Avenue. I said, why me? He said, well, he said, I think you can help. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Marty. He and Jay Oliva, who was then the president, they came to my office. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I'm going to think about it. And I'm going to talk to a lot of people, and I'll get back to you but I want time. I was now uh, 64 years old. Uh, <coughs> Home Depot was flying. I was still very active. I was active for the next nine years. I left the board. Bernie and I set up the rule 73 and out. So Bernie turned 73 five years before me and he left and then I turned 73. Meanwhile, Arthur bought the football team, the great success, and he left. So the three of us went separate. And Pat retired early, Pat Farah, who was effectively the fourth founder. So I started my work and I went down. I talked to a lot of doctors and I'm scratching my head. I'm saying, oh my God, this is nuts. Everybody dislikes everybody. They do great medicine here. They do great research. <coughs> Sork and Sabin. The two polio vaccines, mm. Sork and Sabin are NYU medical school graduates. I mean, great science. But there was a depression in the place like I'd never seen before. Well, they would, they'd merge with Mount Sinai, and it was a merger from hell. Mount Sinai thought they were getting rid of a lemon, and NYU thought they were getting rid of a lemon, so they put two lemons together and created one big lemon. <laughs> and the one thing I concluded was if I took this job, I wasn't going to do it if the merger continued. So, and God bless my wife. She, she was 16 and I was 18 when we met each other and 65 years later, we're still here. And uh, I say in the book, and I mean it, most of what happened to me wouldn't have happened if she wasn't by my side, big time. So I said, you know what? I wanna do this. So I went home. I said, Elaine, I gotta talk to you. She said, what's that? I said, you know, Marty wants me to do this. I've been studying it. There's something great here. There's something big time great. And it's crazy. The hard work is done. The brains are here. The talent is here. The buildings, the, board, the building department, the board of health should shut it up. It's a mess. But hell, that's the easiest thing to fix. So she said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to do two things. I want to take the job. And I think you and I ought to give them 100 million bucks. God bless her. She said, do we have that kind of money? I said, yeah, I, I, I think we can handle it. I said, you know. So that's was the first hundred. And, and my first meeting was like this. With, I, I believe in town meetings. I think, I think communications are very important one-on-one. -on -one. I think you can write all the memos in the world and all the bulletins in the world. Nothing succeeds quite so much as being in a room with people and seeing their body language and looking at their eyes and deciding be yourself, whether they're telling you the truth or they're snowing you. So anyway, uh, I have this meeting with the docs, and I said, I'm going to tell you something right now. Like, dean, the then dean, Bob Glickman, good man, he was the uh, chief of medicine at Beth Israel up in Boston, which is <coughs> part of the Harvard system. And he took this job, and it wasn't what he thought it was going to be, and he was mighty depressed. So I'm sitting up there, and I said, let me tell you, I said, the one thing I wish I had right now is to write a prescription, be able to write a prescription like you guys can do. Because if I had that authority, 
the first thing I would do is double Dr. Glickman's dosage of Prozac because this guy <laughs> is in bad shape. <laughs> and we got to laugh. And I said, and I'm going to make you one promise I know I can keep. Not one of you in this room are going to get everything you want. But I'm going to break my ass to make sure each and every one of you have more than you have right now. That's all I can promise you. Well, we got to write it, and then we hired Bob Grossman to come in as the chief of radiology. Bob Glickman spent nine years at it and did a fabulous job, but he was time for him to move on. And I wanted Bob Grossman to have the job. You know, you, you academics, it's crazy. To, you, know, you got to. So I called John Sexton, who's then the president of the university. I said, John, I got the guy. He's here. Oh no, no, no! You got to. We got to run a ad in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and we got to do this, and we got to do that. And what are you talking about? The guy's right here. What the hell am I spending all this time and wasting all this money? What are you nuts? No, no. Now let me tell you about doctors. <laughs> They, they write. Each, each candidate's got piles. They call extra. These are the research. Because one of the things you want to know about is do they do research? Do they teach? Because this is an academic position, dean and CEO. Do they do research? Do they, and do they see patients? That's a three-legged stool. So I said, okay, we'll go through the process. And I knew he was it. And thank God. Thank God, the search committee, and by the way, the guy that ran the search, Joe Zuckerman, he's the chief of orthopedics at NYU, he's spectacular. He's still there, he's phenomenal. What he's done with our orthopedics program is phenomenal. So, thank God it worked out that way. So now, here we are, we're down to the final interview with the final three. I'm gonna tell you exactly what I said. And Bob <coughs> is in there, and we're about to negotiate a big deal with Siemens for imaging equipment, big, big deal. Part of the deal was going to be they were going to loan us $450 million to build a tower. That's how much they wanted the business. Bob says to the search committee, and by the way, if I can't close that deal with Siemens, you shouldn't give me the job. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I'm saying to myself, I can't believe this guy just took a gun out, blew off one foot, blew off the other foot, and now he's getting ready for the brain. I said, <laughs> so everybody's looking around. You know, I could see it went over like a, ton of bricks. So we leave the meeting. I said, you know, I want to talk to you. I said, you know what? You've got a Jewish name. You've been bar mitzvahed. There's no way you're Jewish. You're too stupid to be Jewish. <laughs> you were adopted from a Catholic orphanage by Jewish parents. Okay? What do you mean? What do you mean? I said, what do I mean? I said, I got the damn deck stacked and we're all set and you're sitting here telling them you're going to let these people in Germany decide whether you should get this job or not. So I called John. How many people play golf in the room? Raise your hand. So I called John Sexton and I said, John, I need a mulligan. What the hell's a mulligan? I said, I need a do-over. What do you mean? I said, I got to have Bob come back to the committee. We well, came back to the committee. He got the job. He's been phenomenal. He's been absolutely, what he's done with that place, you know, I, I get a lot of the glory. And by the way, the 100 we gave the first time was anonymous. We didn't want anybody to know we did it. And when, we, when he got the job, I knew. I knew right then this place is going to fly. And so Elena and I doubled down. We gave him the second. And at that point, they came to me and said, listen, if you all allow us to put your name on this place, we know we'll be able to raise a lot more money. I said, nah, that's nonsense. I don't want it. I, I, look, I know who I am and I like who I am. I guess that's not good. That means you got an ego. Uh, and so they did. And I'm happy to tell you now we're at the tail end of the campaign. We're, we've raised $2.8 billion so far. I got $450 million gifts. They were right. They were right. So, and Bob Grossman... And in this book that Bill Hazeltine wrote about the transformation, th this is nothing. We're last year we, when we when Bob started, I think we were 37th or 38th in national rankings of medical schools. We're now third. Harvard's one, Hopkins two, and we're third. And I have no doubt those other guys ought to worry. Okay. Yeah. So it's all about the people, and that's one more thing I'll leave you with. 
It's always about the people. Always, always, always. Why, why did Sam Walton with four little crummy five and dime stores in Bentonville, Arkansas, start there at the same time, Pete Cunningham and, and Walmart, and Pete Cunningham and Kresge, which became Kmart, had this phenomenal success called Kmart. They had all these Kresge stores all over the United how, how did it end up that Kmart ends up going broke and Walmart is the biggest, most successful corporation in the world in sales. How? The people. How did Home Depot do it? The people. It's always about the people. I can't tell you. All the textbooks you're going to read, all the studying you're going to do, if you can get to people's hearts, if you can let them know you care about them, you matter, it matters. You know, I, I'll tell you something that might frighten you a little bit. If I would ever go, I taught at Stern School a number of years ago. But if I was asked, okay, you can only have one book in this business school, what will it be? It would be both the Old and New Testament of the Bible. All the lessons are in that book. Whether you believe in God or not, I'm not here to preach, I'm not going to proselytize any of you, okay? That's your call. But all of the things that work are in that book. Do unto others as you have others do unto you. Think of the other guy. It's amazing. We have Home Depot has no patents. Home Depot has no uh, uh, intellectual property. <coughs> How? Same with Walmart. How? Turn the people on. Make them feel, this is my place. Hey, I'm a Home Depot stock owner. I own the whole store. When you got them there, you got them. But when you get them there, you've got to make sure you treat them better than when they got there. So let me ask you this. Sure. Why are so many young people not turned on to capitalism? John, that's a good question. <laughs> the question I ask myself all the time. The tragedy is the young people include educated young people. Why don't we take a hard look at Venezuela or Cuba or Russia or all these other countries? And why don't we ask ourselves the question, what happened? Venezuela was the wealthiest country in South America 30 years ago. And today people are starving to death. Look, capitalism is flawed. It's flawed. I grant you, it's flawed. But it's still the best of all. 400, yeah, we, don't, we, we only have 3,000 3, people that are multimillionaires, but we've got 400,000 people that have a job every day and they go to work and they, we've never hired, in the history of the company, we've never hired one person for minimum wage, ever. Okay, and we, we, we want to move them up the ladder. We want to see them become the assistant store managers, store managers, district managers. We, we love it. We love to see this thing happen. It's got to be a party for everybody. The, the thing that frightens me this is a slippery slope. You want proof? We took a medical center and we did what we did with it. Look at the VA system in America today. Look at the hospitals that are in the government. Government doesn't necessarily, well, there are certain things we need the government to do, defense, police, fire, all these, all these things, these services we need for our protection. There's a million things we need, but to assume that government's going to do it better than the private sector is one of the most fallacious thoughts in the world. Now, wh why do they do it? Well, when somebody tells you about free school, free health, free this, free that, sounds pretty good. Sounds like utopia. Now, let me make a concession to you. The biggest challenge to our nation right now is income inequality. We have got to figure a way out to bring more people to the party. Got to do it. We, there's no option other than to make sure that the people at the lower, my parents, the people at the lower end of the rung have hope, have a belief that it's for them as well, that, that whatever they have to do, if they do it and they go by the system and they behave, they're going to be at the party. Th this to me is part of the social responsibility of business. It's not only good business, it's morally the right thing to do. Back to the buy. It's a morally right thing to do. 
We don't have the glory and choice of not doing it. But there's another dark secret in America, big time. Public education is a disaster in America. It's a horrible, horrible failure. We have kids in New York that are getting high school diplomas that can't do fourth grade math and fifth grade English. Okay, how can we, how can we bring people into the process of business if they can't count and they can't read? So, so it's a, it's a two-headed problem. I know this much, if we don't speak to the genius of this America about what we can do about this problem, we have serious, because I'll tell you, I know one thing right now, and I got no horse in this race anymore. You know, I'm 83, and thank God I did okay. We're going to have a horrible problem on our hands if we don't address it. The biggest single social issue we have. And the way to do it is a thriving, robust economy where people have a chance to be in it, where people have a chance to go with it and grow with it. And the opportunity, I'm saying this to all of you kids now, I mean the real kids in the room. This country has more opportunities now than it did when I was your age. There are more opportunities now. It may be a little harder to identify and find, but they're there. They're there. And I one more thing I'll tell you about capitalism. If you can't dis deal with the possibility of failure, don't do it. Okay, John. Okay, just uh, remind us who the head of your American stores happens to be in uh, the background. The head of our American stores is a wonderful woman by the name of Anna Marie Campbell. She's from Jamaica. She started with us as a part-time cashier. She's responsible for the 1,700 U.S. stores. It's not Canada and New Mexico. We got where the big st where the stores are mostly. She runs them all. She's the head of the she's the head of the stores. Okay. She's fabulous. She's not good. She's spectacular. If you want proof, go into the stores and talk to the people in the stores about Anna Marie Campbell. That's the party has got to be for everybody, every single human being. All right, let's take some questions now. I know a lot of people want to ask questions, so I'm going to, first of all, ask uh, some of our students to ask questions, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and we'll take three questions from three students to kick it off. Okay, so let, let's take the lady at the front. So just ju be brief, if you could. Um, and then we'll take uh, a couple more student questions, one over here. Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. So do you think it's better to like follow your passion and be in poverty or to be lukewarm about a job and be rich? Well, you won't be rich if you're lukewarm about your job. You won't last, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, pr prayfully, prayfully, your passion is in an area yeah, in the where there's a need. It starts with that, you know, supply and demand. But I can guarantee you, you will not be rich if you wake up every day and say, oh, Christ, I got to go to that job again. Mm -hmm. It won't work. That dog won't hunt. It won't happen. You got a much better chance of success if you can't wait to get to work in the morning. If you wish it never turned dark. If you wish you didn't have to sleep an hour. I can, I, one more thing I tell people. You know when you got the right job? You know you got the right job when you're willing to pay to go to work. <laughs> that's when you know you got the right job. And that's not practical because you got to eat and you got to pay your rent and everything. But I'm just saying. Yes, sir. Right. Second question. Um, so my question would be, how do you inspire people who are becoming more content with not being part of the party? Well, I think you can't. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Not everybody falls into the category of lackadaisical, okay, or indifferent. You got to find that I, I believe that by example, you motivate people. Leadership to me is don't ask anybody to do anything you wouldn't do yourself, mm -hmm. okay? I mean that. Bernie and I would never walk into a Home Depot store, ever walk into a Home Depot store, unless we were pushing a few carts in from the parking lot. And I pray to God that the kid that's in the lot sees us and he knows who we are. So he can say, hey, if it's not too small for them, it's not too small for me. 
I just, just want to clarify, Ken, that yep. uh, the Bernie that he's referring to is not Bernie Sanders. But, oh. but, uh, <laughs> Hardly at all. Bernie Marcus, the co-founder of Home, Home Depot. Depot. Yes. Look, one thing we know about people, if you've given it your best shot to help them, to motivate them, to lead them, to inspire them, and there's no traction, the best thing you can tell them is you're in the wrong place because they won't succeed. And they're going to be miserable 30 years later when they see kids like you come in and all of a sudden one day you're a district manager and he's still in that same store. Mm -hmm. You're not doing anybody a favor by keeping them in an environment where they can't blossom. Okay? Okay. Hi. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you on all, all the success you've done so far. I know Home Depot right now is the fifth largest private employer in the United States. Right. And um, I know along this path that you've taken, there have been many like times where you were tried and you've definitely like encountered failures. So I wanted to ask, what was one of your biggest failures and how did you rebuttal? Oh. First of all, I need six months to tell you all about my failures. <laughs> okay. My biggest failures, without regard to size, are the ones where you think it's going to work and it doesn't work. And, and by the way, if you're an entrepreneur and you haven't got the ability to bounce, don't become an entrepreneur. Okay? <coughs> you, uh, failure should be a motivation to give it a shot again. Try again. And keep going. So, I'm not exaggerating. I could probably think of 30 or 40 situations that flopped. But each one of them was a motive for me to keep going, to pick up and keep trying. And, and what you need to do, though, is take a step back and say, okay, where, where was the equation flawed? Where was, where was what I looked at not what I thought it was. And would it have made a difference? So every, look, I, I'm, I'm not being trite. I haven't learned a damn thing from my success, but boy, have I got lessons from failure. And that's pretty true for everybody. You learn more from your failures than you do your successes. Take it as a learning experience. Take it as an opportunity to figure out what to do right the next time or what not to do the next time. Um, One Adam. Here. One here. Uh, let, let, oh, go ahead. Let's go, okay. go over here first. Yeah, sure. Ken, for, for the benefit of some of the younger people in the audience, if, if you were dropped on the earth at the age of 18 uh -huh. and you had no money, uh -huh. with everything you know, uh -huh. what would you do if you were starting over? Figure a way how to eat so I could live. <laughs> you know, survival <coughs> is a key to everything. But the first thing I would do, and I'm, I'm, I'm an instinctive entrepreneur. To this day, to this day, I still love to work with startups. You got to take a step back and ask yourself the question, basic question, is there a human want or a human need? You know, a guy that's going to go in the buggy whip business today, I can guarantee he's going to fail because there's no more buggy whips out there. So the first thing you have to do is be realistic about what you're doing. If I was 18 years old, I would urge kids, I would urge kids, get an education, but let me qualify the word education. One of the biggest mistakes I think we're making in America, college is not for everybody. There are jobs crying right now, big paying jobs, plumbers, electricians, carpenters. Guess what? I tell my, my, my driver's son, he wanted to get into the auto mine line workers union and I got him in. And I said, now, Brian, I want you to learn all about the business. And one day I want you to come to me and tell me you're going to start your ornamental iron works company. <clears throat> the fact that you're a tradesman doesn't mean you can't be a capitalist. Mm -hmm. That's, that's when you want to, if you want to work for somebody else by the hour, then fine. You're going to get paid by the hour and that's the end of it. And when there's no work, you're out of work. Take, take the talent, take the knowledge and convert it into a business. But more important than anything else, love what you're doing. You, every day, I, God, I, why do I have to sleep, God? Why can't I work 24 hours a day? <laughs> I'm serious. That's the passion you have to have. And I got to tell you, and I'm not bragging. I'm telling you the truth. My, my wife, my son, I have a full-service truck leasing business in North Carolina. And we were out buying trucks from Packard in Seattle, my, my middle son. He now runs the firm in New York. And we were out there, and I was working on three deals at one time. We were having lunch with the chairman of PACCAR, uh, Chuck Piggott. 
So I'm, I got these three deals going, and we're having lunch in Chuck's private dining room. And I said, Chuck, I need a room with a phone. And he gave me a room, and I found out I had to have a second call. And not like now where you can conference. This is 35 years ago. So I said, Chuck, I need another room. So and then I needed a third room. So I've got three phone calls. I'm running from one to one. And, and so Pickett, <coughs> Chuck says to my son, you know why your father works so hard? He said, oh, yeah, I know. He said, he's sick. <laughs> I am sick. I love it. I can't get enough of it. And you know something right now? If you have that kind of passion, I don't care what it is, you'll succeed. So uh, I wanted to... Oh, I gotta, I gotta, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to uh, go back to your uh, question, or go back to your experience at NYU. Uh, I went oh. to college in LA, and Miami's a market that's very similar. And it, it also ties into what you're talking about, about public schools and you know the government and mm -hmm. socialism. I feel like a lot of young people see that the private companies aren't uh, going out to help the poor people in, you know, that have medical problems in those markets. And that's why the, there's that appeal to socialism, and that's why the public schools kind of struggle. And a lot, if, if private schools were less focused on rankings and more on helping poor people, that might alleviate some of that concern. So my question is, how, does, how did you at NYU convince doctors to come to a school that was doing poorly, or, or how do you do that for school? School was not doing poorly. School was not doing poorly. The quality of education was first class. The place was a shambles because it was a it was a, a it was a stepchild. And they didn't want to put any money into it because this place is going to suck us into the black hole. Okay. They are. Let me tell you what. Business gets a bum rap. Business gets a bum rap. L look at your chart. Come to New York City and and look at the efforts that. Corporations, the banks, the bad guys. You know, the banks, 08, we're the bad guys. We've got a black patch on our eye. You know, we're the guys that walked in and said, we're going to hold you up or we're going to shoot you if you don't give us all your money. Go look. Come on. I have a charter school. I was chairman of a charter school in Harlem. Our kids are flying. They're flying. They're doing great. Where does the money come from? The private sector. Same is true. Look at the I'm on the board of Ronald McDonald House in Manhattan, the largest Ronald McDonald House in the world, 104 rooms. Where does the money come from? The private sector. Go to the New York the Museum of Natural History. Names all over. Private sector. Go to your University of Miami. And go around and look at the names. Guess where the money came from? Guys like Jim McLemore that said, hey, you know what? I did okay. I'm going to share it. Or Jenkins. Okay, I can go on and on and on and on. We can do better. Okay, we can do a whole lot better. But I can guarantee you right now, if you want to know the fruits of what the alternative is, go to Venezuela. Go, I'll give you a free ride on my plane. I'll take you down, drop you off. Uh, it's only three and a half hours from here. No, how, not, how many seats do you have? No, no, I have 11 <laughs> seats. I got a Global Express, okay? Right, okay? No, I'm telling you. All right, let's. I'll take 10 more with you. We got time for a couple more. I think yes, the lady in the front row. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. So it's clear that you obviously advocate, be passionate about what you do. So when you and the other co-founders went to found Home Depot, mm -hmm. did you found it because you saw an underlying need for a business like that, or because you all shared an underlying passion for building things? <laughs> How about a combination of all of them? Number one, I'll tell you what we saw. We saw an industry used to have a chain down here called Scotty's. The industry was fragmented geographically, and they all behaved. I didn't go in your territory, you didn't come in my. So you had Rickle, per Pergament, Channel up in the Northeast, Somerville Lumber in Boston. You had Heckinger's in the Mid Atlantic. You had uh, Payless Cashways in, in Mid America. You had Handy Dan. They were all, they used to get together in Chicago, but they all kept their little fiefdoms. They were getting outrageously high prices. There were very low service levels and limited assortment. Bernie was the guy. Bernie, Bernie's a genius. Bernie saw the opportunity, <clears throat> big boxes. Now, by the way, big then, the typical hardware store was 25, 30,000 square feet. He was talking about 60,000 square feet. Our stores today are 125,000 square feet. He was talking about low prices, a wide assortment, and great service. The secret sauce is the service. 
The, kid, the Home Depot's success is because of all those wonderful people who put an apron on every single day. That's the magic potion. And we saw it. We offered Kroger Company 10% of the company for two million bucks. They said, it can't work. You can't have high service levels, wide assortment, and low prices. Guess what? We proved them wrong. And, and that's the other thing. If you got conviction, go with it. Go with it. You know what? Everybody told us it wouldn't work. I, I had to go around and beg people, literally beg people to get two million bucks to get it started. In fact, when we opened the store, Two first two stores we opened was in Atlanta. We didn't have enough money. The vendors gave us as much credit as they could. So we had enough merchandise for the store level. So all these shelves here and all down below were all empty. It looked like we were going out of business the day we opened. <laughs> Use your mind and your imagination. Pat Farah. Pat Farah. Genius. Got all these empty spaces. He calls up all the vendors. He said, okay, I understand you won't take any more risk. How about giving us empty boxes with your labels on them? So when you come into a Home Depot store, holy Mike, look at all the merchandise. Oh my God. It was all air. <laughs> there were empty boxes, and everybody said, Oh my God, I can't believe it. <laughs> the mind is more precious than the wallet. And you look at the great ideas, and you look at the things that happen, whether it's, whether it's Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, I don't care who it is, it all emanates out of a mind. And that's more important. That's the best of all capital in the world. Anyway. I, uh, I promised uh, you would. I've got to get to a Home Depot director's right. retirement dinner, and yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, so let, let, let me just conclude, Ken, sure. by saying, you know, I promised... Uh, everyone here that we would bring only the best to Miami Business School. You've done it. Well, I, I want to, I want to leave you, I want to leave you, I want to leave you with one more thought. You, we live in the finest country on earth. There'll never be another America again like us. Do we have problems? You bet we do. Do we have things we can do better? Absolutely. I can go on and on and on. But guess what? Why does everybody want to come here? The big fight now is about people that want to come in. I asked my grandfather one time, well, I'll tell you, I wear my American flag pin, and when I put it on every day, honest to God, I look up at the sky and I say, Grandma and Grandpa, thanks for coming to America. I asked my grandfather one time, Grandpa, you never went back to Italy. Why? And he couldn't speak English. So my mother had to interpret. He said, I left there because there was nothing there for me. Why would I go back? That says it all. Are we, do we have problems? Yes, we do. But damn it, there's no place on this earth like America. Never will be another one like Love it. Do all you can to make it strong. Criticize it for things that need to be fixed. And if you think you could help fix it, fix it. Make the effort. And there's no city in America like Miami. Oh, boy. <laughs>